Understood Betsy by Dorothy Canfield Fisher Retold by Mina Morris Chapter 2 Betsy Holds the Reins You might imagine how scared Elizabeth Ann was as the train took her to Vermont and the Putney Farm. Everything happened so fast. Her bag was packed, a message sent, and she caught the train. She didn't have time to think, to say she didn't want to go. She felt that no one would listen to her, even if she did say something. Now that Aunt Frances wasn't there to take care of her, it felt like her world had ended. She always needed Aunt Frances, even in familiar places. And now, she wasn't being taken to Putney Farm. She was being sent there. She sat in her seat, feeling more and more scared as she got closer to the end of her journey. She looked out at the winter landscape. It looked so ugly to her with its brown fields and trees and the fast little streams. She always heard from the adults that she couldn't handle the cold, and this place looked very cold. The train slowed down as it went up, a steep hill. Elizabeth Ann felt the floor tilt under her feet. A passenger asked the conductor, Pretty steep hill, right? Yes, it is, replied the conductor. We're almost at Hillsborough, at the top. After that, it's downhill to Rutland. He then spoke to Elizabeth Ann. Hey, little girl, didn't your uncle say you're getting off at Hillsborough? You should get your things ready. Elizabeth Ann was very afraid of meeting new people. When the conductor helped her off the train, he had to carry both her and her bag because she was shaking. At the small station, there was only one person, a serious-looking old man with a fur cap and heavy coat standing by a wagon. This is her, Mr. Putney, said the conductor, tipping his cap before going back to the train which left quickly. Now, Elizabeth Ann was alone with her great-uncle Henry. He nodded at her and put a warm cape over her shoulders. The women were worried you might get cold, he said. He helped her onto the wagon seat, put her bag in, and got in himself. They started moving. Elizabeth Ann was used to being hugged and asked a lot of questions after train trips. She sat quietly, feeling lonely and forgotten. Her feet didn't touch the wagon's floor. She felt she was in a very dangerous place, like in her bad dreams. She wished Aunt Frances was there to take care of her. She looked up at Uncle Henry her eyes showing her fear, the kind of look that would usually make Aunt Frances come quickly to comfort and reassure her. Uncle Henry looked at Elizabeth Ann seriously. His face, toughened by the weather, didn't show much emotion. Here, you drive, will you, for a bit, he said, giving her the reins, putting on his glasses, and taking out a pencil and paper. I need to do some calculations. Pull on the left rein to go left, and the other way for the other way. We probably won't meet any other carts. Elizabeth Ann was so scared that she almost screamed. She was interested in holding the reins, but she still let out a small yelp. She was ready to explain to Uncle Henry why she was scared and almost screamed, but Uncle Henry didn't seem to notice her yelp. He was focused on his calculations. Oh, 
the horses were moving to one side. Quickly, she figured out which was her right hand and pulled that rein. The horses turned their heads slightly, and they were back in the middle of the road. Elizabeth Ann was relieved and proud. She looked at Uncle Henry for praise, but he was busy writing numbers, not noticing her. Oh no, they were going to the left again. This time, she got confused and pulled the left rein by mistake. The horses walked off the road into a ditch and the wagon tilted. Why wasn't Uncle Henry helping? He was still busy with his figures. Elizabeth Ann, sweating, pulled the other rein. The horses went back up the slope. The wagon made a scary sound against the wagon box. She thought they would tip over. But they were back on the road, safe, with Uncle Henry still adding numbers. Elizabeth Ann thought if he only knew how close they were to danger and how she saved them. She needed to remember which hand was her right hand to avoid that mistake again. Then, something clicked in Elizabeth Ann's head. She realized she didn't need to know which was right or left. If she just pulled the way she wanted to go, the horses wouldn't know if it was the right or left rein. Maybe it was her brain waking up. She was nine years old and in the third grade, but this was the first time she had a thought all by herself. At home, Aunt Frances always knew what to do and helped her with difficult things. At school, her teachers always thought faster than the students. People always explained things to Elizabeth Ann so much that she never found out anything by herself. This was a small discovery, but her own. Elizabeth Ann felt as excited as a bird with its first egg hatching. Elizabeth Ann forgot she was scared of Uncle Henry and excitedly told him about her discovery. It's not about right or left, she said with pride. It's about which way you want to go. Uncle Henry listened carefully, looking at her over his glasses. After she finished, he said, Well, now that's true, and went back to his calculations. This was a short reply, much shorter than anything Elizabeth Ann had heard from Aunt Frances or her teachers. They always explained things in detail, but Uncle Henry's simple words felt important and satisfying. Elizabeth Ann felt good that he agreed with her. She focused on driving again. The big, slow horses had stopped while she was talking to Uncle Henry. They stood very still, as if their feet were stuck to the road. Elizabeth Ann looked at Uncle Henry, waiting for him to tell her what to do next. He was busy with his numbers. She had been taught not to interrupt, so she waited quietly. But it was a cold day, and she started to feel the cold wind and emptiness. She was tired of waiting and remembered how the grocer's boy started his horse. Taking a deep breath and glancing at Uncle Henry, who was still silent, she tapped the reins on the horse's backs and made a clicking sound like the grocer's boy. The horses lifted their heads and started walking. Elizabeth Ann's face turned red with happiness. She felt very proud, like she had started a big car. It was the first thing she had ever done by herself, and it worked. She drove for a long time, focusing only on that. She steered the horses around stones and through muddy puddles. 
she kept them right in the middle of the road. She was surprised when Uncle Henry put away his paper, took the reins, and drove into a yard with a small white house and a big red barn. He didn't say anything, but she guessed this was Putney Farm. Two women came out of the house, one old and one younger, like Aunt Harriet and Aunt Frances, but different. The dark-haired woman was tall and strong, and the white-haired one was rosy and plump. They smiled at Elizabeth Ann. Well, father, you got her, I see, said the brown-haired woman. She came to the wagon and held out her arms. Come on, Betsy, and get some supper, she said, as if Elizabeth Ann had always lived there. That was how Elizabeth Ann arrived at Putney Farm. The brown-haired woman took a few big steps and lifted Elizabeth Ann onto the porch. You take her in, mother, she said. I'll help father with the horses. The plump, rosy, white-haired woman took Elizabeth Ann's thin, cold hand with her soft, warm one, and led her to the kitchen door. I'm your Aunt Abigail, she said. Your mother's aunt, you know. That's your cousin Anne who helped you down, and Uncle Henry brought you from town. She closed the door and continued. I don't know if your Aunt Harriet ever told you about us, so... Elizabeth Ann quickly interrupted remembering what Aunt Harriet had said about them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, she said. She always talked about you. She talked a lot. She... Elizabeth Ann stopped and bit her lip. Aunt Abigail, noticing the look on Elizabeth Ann's face, only showed a deeper wrinkle around her eyes. She said seriously, well, that's good. You know all about us, then. She took a pan of baked beans from the oven. Elizabeth Ann didn't like beans, and said, Take off your things, Betsy, and hang them on that hook behind the door. That's your hook. Elizabeth Ann struggled with her cape and coat. At home, Aunt Frances or Grace always helped her with these. She felt very sorry for herself. Aunt Abigail then told her, You must be cold. Sit close to the stove. She moved quickly around the kitchen, shaking the floor. Elizabeth Ann was surprised. Aunt Abigail was one of the fattest people she had ever seen, which was so different from Aunt Frances and Aunt Harriet. Aunt Abigail seemed to forget about Elizabeth Ann for a moment. Elizabeth Ann sat on a chair, feeling homesick and sad. The room was ugly to her, with low ceilings and only kerosene lamps for light. They had no servant, and they ate in the kitchen like poor people. No one spoke to her or asked how she was. She felt very alone far from Aunt Frances. She started to feel like crying. Aunt Abigail, busy with supper, suddenly stopped and said, There, as if she remembered something. She quickly pulled a kitten from under the stove. It was sleepy and yawning. Here, Betsy, Aunt Abigail said, placing the kitten in Elizabeth Ann's lap. This is one of old Whitey's kittens from last summer. She bothers me a lot. I thought you might take care of her, if you want to, and can feed her, she can be yours. Elizabeth Ann leaned over the warm, furry kitten. She couldn't speak. She always wanted a kitten, but Aunt Frances, Aunt Harriet, and Grace thought cats could make a delicate girl like her sick. She was scared to move. 
thinking the kitten might run away. But as she leaned in, her necktie fell towards the kitten. In the middle of a yawn, the kitten playfully hid it with a soft paw. Then, still sleepy, it licked Elizabeth Ann's hand. She was thrilled. She held still until the kitten washed its face. Then she carefully picked it up and hugged it. The kitten yawned again, and Elizabeth Ann felt its fresh breath. Oh, she whispered. Oh, you darling! The kitten looked at her with bored eyes. Elizabeth Ann asked Aunt Abigail, What is its name, please? Aunt Abigail, busy with pancakes, didn't hear. Elizabeth Ann, forgetting her earlier decision not to call these relatives by the same names as her dear aunts, asked again. Oh, Aunt Abigail, what is its name? Aunt Abigail turned to her. Name, the kittens. I haven't thought of names for kittens in sixty years. You name it, it's yours. Elizabeth Ann had a name in mind already. Eleanor, the prettiest name she knew. Aunt Abigail handed her a pitcher. The cat saucer is under the sink. Do you want to give it some milk? Elizabeth Ann poured milk in the saucer and called, Here, Eleanor, here, Eleanor. Aunt Abigail watched her, her face serious as she brought pancakes to the table. Elizabeth Ann watched the kitten drink milk. She was surprised to see Cousin Anne and Uncle Henry come in, red-cheeked from the cold. Aunt Abigail said, Well, folks, Betsy and I have been busy getting supper ready for you. Elizabeth Ann was confused. She hadn't helped with supper, but everyone started eating without saying anything. She was very hungry and enjoyed the potatoes, ham, cocoa, and pancakes. She was glad no one commented on her, not eating beans. Aunt Frances always said beans were good for growing children because they have protein. Elizabeth Ann knew this well, but still disliked beans. However, no one here seemed to know about her delicate digestion. She was amazed at how many pancakes she was allowed to eat. She had never been allowed to eat as much as she wanted before. They didn't ask Elizabeth Ann how the trip was or pay much attention to her except to keep her plate full. During the meal, Eleanor the kitten jumped into her lap and curled up, purring. Elizabeth Ann petted the kitten with one hand while eating with the other. After supper, Elizabeth Ann didn't realize what happened until she felt someone carrying her upstairs. It was Cousin Anne who lifted her easily and said, You fell asleep at the table. You must be tired. Aunt Abigail was in a big bed with four posts, getting ready for bed. Her hair was curly and fluffy, making her pink face look softer. She quickly braided her hair and put on a white nightcap. Cousin Anne explained, that they didn't have time to prepare a warm bedroom for Elizabeth Ann, so she would sleep with Aunt Abigail. Elizabeth Ann was surprised. She didn't think she was as big as Aunt Abigail. Cousin Anne asked if Aunt Abigail had put the dog, Shep, outside. When Aunt Abigail said she forgot, Cousin Anne left to do it. People at Putney Farm didn't talk much. Elizabeth Ann started getting ready for bed, feeling half her age and very forlorn. She had never shared a bed with an adult and had been told it was bad for children. 
The room was cold, and snow lay on the window sill. She quickly changed into her nightdress, feeling very cold and miserable. Elizabeth Ann got into bed first. Aunt Abigail said she would read a while and sleep on the outside to prevent Elizabeth Ann from falling out. They lay quietly, Aunt Abigail reading essays of Emerson. Elizabeth Ann had seen a new, shiny copy of this book at Aunt Harriet's, but no one ever read it. It looked dull, with no pictures or dialogue. Elizabeth Ann watched the shadows on the ceiling, feeling warmer next to Aunt Abigail, who was like a stove. It was extremely quiet in the room, quieter than any place Elizabeth Ann had ever been, except maybe church. Aunt Harriet's house was near a trolley line, so there were always noises at night. But here, the only sound was Aunt Abigail, quietly turning pages as she read her book. Elizabeth Ann turned to see Aunt Abigail's round, calm face and steady eyes reading. Lying in the warm bed, watching her, Elizabeth Ann felt a change inside her. She felt like something tight was slowly coming undone. She took a few long breaths, feeling something soft and comforting rising inside her. Aunt Abigail put down her book and looked at Elizabeth Ann. Do you know, she said, I think it's going to be really nice having a little girl in the house again. At that moment, the tight feeling in Elizabeth Ann's heart completely disappeared. She started to cry, but these tears were different from any she had cried before. And they were the last tears for a long time. Aunt Abigail said, Well, well. She moved over and took Elizabeth Ann into her arms, comforting her without saying much. She held Elizabeth Ann close until the crying lessened. Then she asked, I hear your kitty crying outside the door. Shall I let her in? She might want to sleep with us. I think there's room for three of us. Aunt Abigail went to the door, and the floor shook as she walked. Her nightcap cast a long shadow, but when she came back with the kitten, Elizabeth Ann didn't find anything funny about her. Aunt Abigail handed Eleanor to Elizabeth Ann and got back into bed. There. Now I guess we're ready for the night, she said. Put the kitty on the other side so she won't fall out. She turned off the light and moved closer to Elizabeth Ann, who felt enveloped in warmth. The kitten snuggled under her chin. Aunt Abigail's presence was like a protective wall against the dark room. Elizabeth Ann breathed deeply, and the next thing she knew, it was morning, and the sun was shining through the window. End of chapter 2 